Good morning. This is Ron. Welcome to Story Time. Good morning. Uh, again, this is Ron, and this is uh, Story Time, and uh, I am recording this on location at Lovebirds uh, Bakery and Cafe at uh, on Colorado Boulevard in Pasadena, California, and uh, we're reading from the book The Virtue of Selfishness by Ayn Rand, and this is Chapter 18, Counterfeit Individualism, written by Nathaniel Brandon, one of her associates. The theory of individualism is a central component of the objectivist philosophy. Individualism is at once an ethical political concept and an ethical psychological one. As an ethical political concept, individualism upholds the supremacy of individual rights, the principle that man is an end in himself, not a means to the ends of others. As an ethical psychological concept, individualism holds that man should think and judge independently, valuing nothing higher than the sovereignty of his intellect. The philosophical base and validation of individualism, as Ayn Rand has shown in Atlas Shrugged, is the fact that individualism, ethically, politically, and psychologically, is an objective requirement of man's proper survival, of man's survival qua man, qua rational being. It is implicit in and necessitated by a code of ethics that holds man's life as its standard of value. The advocacy of individualism as such is not new. What is new is the objectivist validation of the theory of individualism and the definition of a consistent way to practice it. Too often, the ethical, political meaning of individualism is held to be doing whatever one wishes, regardless of the rights of others. Writers such as Nietzsche and Max Stirner are sometimes quoted in support of this interpretation. Altruists and collectivists have obvious vested interest in persuading men that such is the meaning of individualism, that the man who refuses to be sacrificed intends to sacrifice others. The contradiction in and refutation of such an interpretation of individualism is this. Since the only rational base basis no, the only rational base of individualism as an ethical principle is the requirements of man's survival qua man, one cannot claim the moral right to violate the rights of another. If he denies inviolate rights to other men, he cannot claim such rights for himself. He has rejected the base of rights. No one can claim the moral right to a contradiction. Individualism does not consist merely of rejecting the belief that man should live for the collective. A man who seeks escape from the responsibility of supporting his life by his own thought and effort and wishes to survive by conquering, ruling, and exploiting others is not an individualist. An individualist is a man who lives for his own sake and by his own mind. He neither sacrifices himself to others nor sacrifices others to himself. He deals with men as a trader, not as a looter, as a producer, not as an Attila. It is the recognition of this distinction that altruists and collectivists wish men to lose. The distinction between a trader and a looter, between a producer and an Attila. If the meaning of individualism in its ethical political context has been perverted and debased predominantly by its avowed antagonists, the meaning of individualism in its ethical psychological context has been perverted and debased predominantly by its professed supporters, by those who wish to dissolve the distinction between an independent judgment and a subjective whim. There are the alleged individualists who equate individualism not with independent thought, but with independent feelings. There are no such thing as independent feelings. There's only an independent mind. An individualist is, first and foremost, a man of reason. It is upon the ability to think, upon his rational faculty that man's life depends. Rationality is the precondition of independence and self-reliance. An individualist is neither independent nor self-reliant. It is a contradiction in terms. Individualism and independence are logically inseparable. The basic independence of the individualist consists of his loyalty to his own mind. It is his perception of the facts of reality, his understanding, his judgment, that he refuses to sacrifice to the unproved assertions of others. That is the meaning of intellectual independence, and that is the essence of an individualist. He is dispassionately and intransigently fact-centered. Man needs knowledge in order to survive, and only reason can achieve it. Men 
Let's try this again. Men who reject the responsibility of thought and reason can exist only as parasites on the thinking of others. And a parasite is not an individualist. The irrationalist, the whim worshiper who regards knowledge and objectivity as restrictions on his freedom, the range of the moment hedonist who acts on his private feelings is not an individualist. The independence that an irrationalist seeks is independence from reality. Like Dostoevsky's underground man who cries, what do I care for the laws of nature and arithmetic, when for some reason I dislike those laws and the fact that twice two makes four. To the irrationalist, existence is merely a clash between his whims and the whims of others. The object, uh, the concept of an objective reality has no reality to him. Rebelliousness or unconventionality as such does not constitute proof of individualism, just as individualism does not consist merely of rejecting collectivism. So it does not consist merely of the absence of conformity. And conformist is a man who declares it's true because others believe it. But an individualist is not a man who declares it is true because I believe it. An individualist declares I believe it because I see reason that it is true. There is an incident in, in The Fountainhead that is worth recalling in this connection. In the chapter on the life and career of co the collectivist Ellsworth Tui, Ayn Rand uh, describes the various groups of writers and artists that Tui organized. There was, ellipses, a woman who never used capitals in her book, and a man who never used commas, and another who wrote poems that neither rhymed nor scanned. Ellipses. There's a boy who used no canvas, but did something with bird cages and metronomes. Ellipses. A few friends pointed out to Ellsworth Tui that he seemed guilty of inconsistency. He was so deeply opposed to individualism, they said. And here were all these writers and artists of his, and every one of them was a rabid individualist. Do you really think so, said Tui, smiling blandly. What Tui knew and what the students of objectivism would, would do well to understand is that such subjectivists in their rebellion against the tyranny of reality are less independent and more abjectly parasitical than most commonplace Babbitt whom they profess to despise. They originate or create nothing. They are profoundly selfless, and they struggle to fill the void of the egos they do not possess by means of the only form of self-assertiveness they recognize. Defiance for the sake of defiance, irrationality for the sake of irrationality, destruction for the sake of destruction, whims for the sake of whims. A psychotic is scarcely likely to be accused of conformity, but neither a psychotic nor a subjectivist is an exponent of individualism. Observe the common denominator in the attempts to corrupt the meaning of individualism as an ethical political concept and as an ethical psychological concept, the attempt to divorce individualism from reason. But it is only in the context of reason and man's needs as a rational being that the principle of individualism can be justified. Torn out of this context, an advocacy of individualism becomes as arbitrary and irrational as the advocacy of collectivism. This is the basis of objectivism's total opposition to any alleged individualists who attempt to equate individualism with subjectivism. And this is the basis of objectivism's total repudiation of any self-styled objectivist who permit themselves to believe that any compromise, meeting ground, or reproachment is possible between objectivism and that counterfeit individualism which consists of declaring, it is right because I feel it, or it is good because I want it, or it's true because I believe it. And uh, that's the end of chapter 18 uh, called Counterfeit Individualism, written by Nathaniel Brandon. And it's, um, Nathaniel Brandon was an associate of Ayn Rand. And this book, uh, The Virtue of Selfishness, is a collection of um, articles and um, speeches by Nathaniel Brandon and Ayn Rand that were edited and uh, put together in this book. This particular chapter was written in April of 1962. So, um, so again, in, in the chapter, uh, they keep referring to objectivism as a, um, a particular uh, philosophy. It would be probably better to describe it as a philosophical theory rather than as a uh, philosophy, because there is no such thing as uh, my philosophy, your philosophy, Ayn Rand's philosophy, Philosophy means the love of 
wisdom. There's and, and we all struggle for the same things to um, uh, be happy and along those lines t- uh, to know what to do. Ultimately, the question we're all asking ourselves is, what should I do? And uh, so, um, the idea that um, you're going to have uh, different um, philosophies is unrealistic. And uh, I think if she's actually, instead of using the word objectivism, if they substitute the word philosophy, perhaps, uh, that would have been um, a better way to go. First of all, if she hadn't created objectivism in the first place, uh, that would have been a better way to go. Because as soon as Ayn Rand created objectivism, she ceased to be objective. And um, so, for instance, it's on this uh, sentence here, what Tui knew and what students of objectivism would do well to understand. Instead, should perhaps read what Tui knew and what students of philosophy would do well to understand. Or what Tui knew and what the realistic would do well to understand. Is that the unrealistic or the idealistic in their rebellion against the tyranny of reality are less independent and more abjectly parasitical than the most commonplace Babbitt whom they profess to despise. Babbitt being a character in uh, the book The Fountainhead, which is what this is referring to. Ellsworth Tui is also a character in um, that book. So, um, again, uh, that I think makes it... Because a lot of uh, Ayn Rand's writing is stilted, kind of... um, in some cases, rather obtuse, and uh, would be uh, could be and should have been uh, edited better, sharpened up, um, as as I have uh, just described. So um, let's see if there's anything else in here. I mean, basically, the overall point of the chapter, uh, counterfeit individualism, is um, well. Um, he puts it across uh, rather well. Um, I still, and, I, and the example that he's using uh, from uh, the book, where you have all these people that are apparently individualistic, they're all doing kind of their own thing artistically, but really what they're all doing is uh, the same thing, which is uh, being defiant for the sake of defiance, irrational for the sake of rationality, destructive for the sake of destruction, and. Uh, impulsivity for the sake of impulsivity. And again, she always used the word whims, and I always found that to be a rather awkward way to describe impulsiveness. And um, But English was not Ayn Rand's first language. It wasn't even her second language. It was her third. She was uh, originally spoke Russian and then French and uh, lastly English. But she did claim in other books that English was her favorite language because it was uh, more flexible than any of the other languages that she knew. So that was the uh, end of uh, chapter 18 and um, next time, which is going to be on Thursday, we are going to uh, finish the book uh, and it's going to be the last chapter called The Argument from Intimidation. To uh, wrap this up, I'm going to read from the back cover and it reads The Virtue of Selfishness. Ayn Rand here sets forth the moral principles of objectivism, the philosophy that holds man's life, the life proper to a rational being, as a standard of moral values and regards altruism as incompatible with man's nature, with the creative requirements of his survival, and with a free society. Ayn Rand wrote Atlas Shrugged, philosophically the most challenging bestseller of its time. Her first novel, We the Living, was published in 1936. With the publication of The Fountainhead in 1943, she achieved a spectacular and enduring success. Ms. Rand's unique philosophy, Objectivism, has gained a worldwide audience. The fundamentals of her philosophy are set forth in four nonfiction books. Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology, For the New Intellectual, The Virtue of Selfishness, and capitalism, the unknown ideal. The magnificent statement of her artistic credo, the Romantic Manifesto, is also available in a Signet edition. And uh, so that's going to be it uh, for today, Tuesday, March the 21st, 2017. And the uh, next episode of um, Storytime will be on Thursday, March 23rd. Thank you very much for listening, and uh, have a great day.